used to just saying, Your Honor. <laughs> How do you say Your Honors? Or Flock of Honors, I don't know. Like that. I remember the, the night we had to put Braniff International into bankruptcy. And after we left Southwest, we were recruited to go over and see if we could see, save Braniff International, which was a billion dollar company there. But it wasn't an Enron, but it was very close. The accounting was questionable. And after we left Southwest and agreed to go try to save this company, uh, we found out we only had 10 days of cash. <clears throat> so we got 10,000 employees, a billion dollar company. We got 500 million in secured debt, 500 million unsecured debt, 18,000 unsecured creditors, and we got 10 days of cash. <laughs> and if you ever want to feel like, oh, what a dummy I am for leaving. <laughs> I wanted to pick up the phone and call Herb Kelleher and say, hey, Herb, I was just kidding. I didn't <laughs> Too late. I made a bad decision. But once we were there, and, and the only thing I did right is I didn't go by myself. I took my CFO, Bill Guthrie, with me. And I always say to business audiences, if you're ever going to do anything crazy like that, don't go by yourself. Take something <laughs> with you. And be, your, be sure your spouse is in, the, in, in agreement as well. So we finally had to put it in Chapter 11 after seven months. We kept it, kept it alive. And that was in 1982, if you remember when, when some of you were too young. But the interest rates were 20% and every inflation, et cetera, was horrible. So we hired a bankruptcy firm from New York. And we had, had the board prepared for two or three months that we might have to do this. And so the, the attorney's name was uh, Creams, Michael Creams. And for some reason, we had to file the petition at 12.01 a.m. And I don't, for the life of me, remember why we had to do it at 01, but there was some legal issue. So the only way we could get it signed was to go to Judge John Flowers' house in Fort Worth, Texas, and get him, to, got him out of bed uh, to come sign the petition. And so they had called ahead of time, the judge said he would do it. So we got there at about a quarter of 12. He's got his bathrobe on. We're sitting in his living room. His wife has already gone to bed. We're all just kind of rubbing our thumbs. What do you say to a bankruptcy judge and all? And finally, the judge broke the ice and he said, I could go for a little shot of cognac. Would that work for you guys as well? <laughs> and he became, he became uh, my hero uh, as a judge. And he uh, had practiced law in Dallas for many years before becoming the bankruptcy judge. But it was a class act. And any time I needed to go back and, what do you call it, go in camera and visit with him and tell him what was going on, he was most open and appreciative. And, uh, he really helped us get the company reorganized, get people back to work. And uh, he stood up to a lot of strong constituencies and stakeholders. And uh, so I was proud to have, uh, have known him. And we stayed in touch for many years. And, Exchanged Christmas cards and all. And now, since we <coughs> moved out here, we live here in, in Sparks, uh, about five miles from here. So it was, I got home from Nashville last night, and it was handy to, uh, I didn't have to get on an airplane today. <laughs> I used this slide yesterday in Nashville, and the, the group that Bill was mentioning was called Get Motivated. And they asked me to join them, uh, well, I guess last March, and I've now done about 12 of them. And it's General Powell and Laura Bush and Rudy Giuliani and uh, Terry Bradshaw was not there yesterday, but he is really he is really fun. But there's usually about ten of us. And I opened with this slide yesterday morning, and just to thank all the veterans uh, in the audience. And I'll tell you, it just brings a tear to your eye, the patriotism, the standing ovation for how our people feel about the military. And I'm proud to have a special guest here today who's from World War II, probably the only World War II veteran in the room. Roy, hold up your hands. This is Roy Powers. And Roy's lovely wife, Jackie Powers, is here too, and we've been friends for many years. Roy was one of the founding directors of the Reno National Championship Air Races in 1964. And then I went on the board in 19, when we moved here. I went on the board back in 96, 97. So uh, we worked together for eight or nine years, and I finally got burned out. I think he did too. So we uh, we got off the board. Thank goodness we got off a few years ago before the horrible accident that happened here a, a 
about three weeks ago. So, for those of you that have served our country, uh, thank you for your service and God bless America. I was trying to come up with a with an acronym for you guys, and the first one I came up with was leadership, impartiality, and ethics. But when you spell that, it comes out why. <laughs> so, I added in another word. I put in an aviation term, a flight plan, a constitution to endure turbulence. I thought life was more appropriate. <laughs> and ethics and, uh, and integrity. Uh, our, I tell Bill earlier that our nephew, my nephew, Bob Trout, is a, uh, an associate circuit judge in Blue Springs, Missouri, just east of Kansas City, and has been for 25 years. And I called him uh, over the weekend and told him I was going to be here. And I said, tell me, because I remember he came here in 1988. And uh, he said, tell me what you remember most from the National Judicial College. And he said, Howard, for me, over the 25 years, it's been very lonely being a judge. I don't have anybody I can talk to. I'm sure you experience this as well. And he said, I go home at night and I kind of grieve by myself and rethink this. So what happened that day? He's mainly handling civil cases now. But he said, in 1998, 1988, when I went to the Judicial College, I met three other judges that I stayed in contact with for all these years. And one of them just passed away uh, last year. But he said, if there's anything I would say to the folks you'll be speaking with, is that make some friends while you're here. And that's, that'll be worth the whole two, or two weeks that you're, uh, you're here forever. I said, what else, what else is important, Bob? And he said, and I wrote it down, he said, I think the advice for new judges is probably no different than for you as a CEO. Be honesty, be diligent, continuing education to stay current, be ahead of the game if you can. Keep respect in the community. Be careful of the clubs you join, uh, the conflicts that you can create, the politics that you can get into. And uh, But he said, other than that, it's been most gratifying. And I said, do, do people ever come up and talk to you and say, thank you for what you've done? And he laughed on the phone. He said, it's only happened once. It was two years ago. I was in line at Walmart. And the lady behind me said, are you Judge Trout? And he thought, uh-oh. And she said, you put our son in jail two years ago for 10 days. And I just want to thank you. You changed his life. So you all carry a, you carry a heavy burden and a heavy responsibility. And I admire, I admire the uh, dedication that you put into this. And for you all being here for the uh, two weeks, I think it's, it's great for our country. I learned this taken granted from chapter 11 that turbulence was inevitable, that misery was optional. And every day was a bad day, it seemed like. Uh, finally, uh, after we had to put it into 11, we were all just let down after working 14 hour days, six and seven days a week. And uh, everybody got sick and got the flu. And we, what we thought we found out was, though, if we would take the turbulence and make it a positive and see how we could make it work for us instead of against us. That was how we were going to get through through all of this. And I was really depressed for the first week or so after the bankruptcy filing because I felt like I'd, I had failed and hadn't been able to save the company. And when I would drive to the DFW airport every morning from Plano, Texas, north of Dallas, I'd put my mind in a funk and just try to forget everything. And I'd pull in that parking lot out of DFW and I'd say, how did I get here? I don't even remember driving the 28 miles. And I'm sure you've all done this too. But I was feeling sorry for myself. Poor Howard, you left Southwest. Poor Howard, you're in bankruptcy. Poor Howard, you got 10,000 people out of work. You'll never get another job. Poor Howard, poor Howard. And I was losing my focus on getting the reorganization started, but nobody had taken me aside and straightened me out. So I had my life-changing experience one morning driving down this two-lane road to DFW. I'm following this big truck. And it's got a crane built back on the platform. And I wasn't tailgating, thank goodness. And when the guy's drive shaft broke and came out from under the truck, <coughs> so here came this 20-foot long missile heading right from my windshield. And I came out of my funk real quick, and I accelerated, and it went right over the top of the car. And I thought, wow, was I lucky. 
And about that time, this transmission housing falls off. <laughs> this big lot of steel comes out, and I run over. So if you've ever been to, to Texas, he was the epitome of a good old Texas boy. He was a little overweight, and he had bib overalls on, and the buttons are unbuttoned on the side, and he's got his pant leg stuff in his boots, and they got mud on him. And he had about a two-day growth of a beard and a chaw tobacco. And he doesn't pay attention to me. He just starts walking around this big truck complaining about what a bad day he was having. <laughs> I got stuck in the mud out in McKinney. Now I'm going to be late for the next job. The boss is going to be mad. Yada, yada, yada. So I look under my car and strip him with oil, but nothing too serious. So I went over and I intercepted him about on his third revolution about this truck. And I said, why don't you come get in the car with me? We'll go into Louisville. We'll find a phone. We'll call your boss. Tell him all your troubles. I want to talk to him and see what kind of insurance you got. <laughs> <laughs> and we'll get on with our life. So he finally gets in the car. I'm dressed up driving. <laughs> he starts all over again. What a bad day he's having. <laughs> and finally he looks over at me and he said, hey, Matt. What do you do for a living? And I said, I'm the president of Brandon. He said, damn, I thought I was having a thing. <laughs> <laughs> Succeeding through turbulent times, and when this, this country has been through tough times in the last three years, and it's not over. And I said to nephew Bob the other night, what are most of the cases you're getting now? And he said, somebody owes somebody else money they can't pay. It just goes on and on, day after day. after day. But I learned that take, succeeding through turbulence is to be prepared, just like you're doing here these two weeks. And then when the time to perform arrives, the time to prepare is past, too late. And I think the best example of that that exemplifies that is uh, Captain Sullenberger, when he landed that Airbus for US Air in the Hudson River. He even had glider training earlier in his career. Now, he never knew that his glider was going to be an Airbus, but uh, he, he made it work. And our son, Mike, is a captain for U.S. Air in Charlotte. And so he told me that after that incident, they've now changed the uh, overwater training and the ditching training for the U.S. Air pilots. And here's what they're doing now. <laughs> I grew up on a farm in Bedford, Iowa, and, and I looked through the roster, and I saw that there are five of you here from Iowa. Yay. Usually I'm the only one. So, welcome. But my dad got the urge to learn how to fly after World War II, and I was just a kid. And he sold enough cows and pigs to get $600 and go buy a Piker Cup like that one. And I remember the day he landed and brought it home on the farm. My mother and two sisters and I are out there applauding this great event. <laughs> I'm thinking, this is kind of ironic. We don't have any electricity. We don't have any indoor plumbing. We don't have any hot water. We got an airplane. <laughs> so I always had a passion for radiation. I assumed I was going to be a pilot. But I'm partly colorblind, so I couldn't go that path. So I started out loading bags and worked my way up the road. But if you look at organizations that are successful for the long term, you find that the founder or the CEO they are passionate about what they do. And I don't think any of you can be successful without a passion for what you're doing. If you don't love being a judge, it's going to be a horribly long career. Uh, and I never felt like I ever had to go to work. I always went to satisfy my, my passion. And, uh, and I think when Steve Jobs passed away last week at, uh, at Apple, you know, there was a great example of, of a company and a man that inspired all of us. And whether you heard, they've closed down all the Apple stores today across the country for two or three hours doing a webcast for all the uh, employees. Every, everybody admired that man. I never met him. And in fact, his, his birth father lives here in Reno, in Boone. He ran the general manager of Boone Town, just rest in Reno. Jobs was adopted when he was a little, little kid. 